Uh, we've done one of these before, and this was a kind of an ad hoc video that I had done. So uh, please excuse the horrible filming job. I don't work for uh, the marketing department, but uh, it turned out to be a pretty effective tutorial in walking through the setup of the the Ford off Kestrel. So what we'll, we'll do is we'll just go through the video. I'll attempt to narrate it as best as I can. Um, uh, this video is on YouTube. You can you can find it. Just search uh, at the top left there where it says uh, Ford off Kestrel setup and you can find it and it's got audio on the actual video. Um, but I'll keep it muted and just kind of go over it. So uh, to start out, we're, we're kind of just walking through the setup on the phone itself because obviously you're going to set up your gun profile on the phone and then you're going to Bluetooth push that to your Kestrel. So um, you got a couple different options once you once you have it connected. And I know, uh, Katie, I know you guys have some great videos um, kind of showing the connection process and how to verify, you know, your serial number is matching what the phone picked up. You know, especially if you do this at a match or at a range where there's a bunch of people with Kestrels, you're going to see a bunch of stuff pop up. So um, check out some of Kestrels videos on those those more uh, unique aspects of connecting it. So yeah, we go through, I'm talking about connecting the device, gun profile management, the different options. So here we went into gun profile management. You can see I have a couple different rifles already built in there. Um, down at the bottom, you can see get profiles and send profiles. So on the Kestrel device itself, you could build the profile on there if you wanted to. Um, say you're out in the field, you didn't have your phone and you went ahead and just built a file on there. If you wanted to extract those files from the Kestrel itself, that's where you would do the get profiles and then obviously send is when you send one from your phone. I'm going to create a new one here. Pops up this screen. Up top is your name. Uh, you name it whatever you want. And then those two uh, options I'm pointing at there, factory ammo and bullet library. So factory ammo, that is every skew of ammunition that Hornady produces uh, is in that factory ammo library. And what that does is if you pick a load out of there, um, it's, it's broken down by caliber and then by load. Um, what we do is we pre-propulate the muzzle velocity for you. So that's based on the SAMI test barrel length muzzle velocity in the majority of, uh, you know, precision shooting rifle cartridges that you're going to be using a Kestrel for. Um, that's going to be a 24 inch standard length barrel. So um, if you have no idea what your velocity is, you don't have a chronograph, you don't have any of that stuff. That's a good way to get you in the ballpark, um, get you, get you on target essentially. And in most cases, um, small errors in your velocity uh, you're not even going to notice them until you are out past four to 500 yards uh, before they start to creep up and you can see, hey, I'm hitting lower, I'm hitting high because my velocity that I have in there is wrong. Um, so you hit factory ammo, you can pick a load, it'll pre-populate velocity, um, and then it'll allow you to decide what drag model you're going to use, whether that's G1, G7, or an actual Ford off bullet model. We'll talk about that in a second. Over on the right side, you see bullet library. So the bullet library is all of the Hornady uh, bullets that we make as well as a bunch of other manufacturers. So you've got Burgers and Sierras and, uh, you know, Nosler and Lapua, a whole bunch of them are in there. We're constantly adding to that library. Uh, there's some 22 long rifle stuff I added in there as well for the guys shooting uh, long distance 22 league stuff. When you go in there, it's, uh, it's just a much more expansive library that includes some, some of our competitor stuff. Um, the intention there is we know other people shoot uh, bullets besides Hornady. And that's great. Other people make great bullets too. Um, but maybe if you're not, uh, if you don't shoot Hornady bullets, maybe one day you'll decide to look at a Hornady bullet and say, hey, that's, you know, as good or better or close or whatever to the bullet I have been shooting from a competitor. I'll give it a try. So that's kind of our intention there. We don't want to alienate the, the user. So uh, you can pick your bullet information out of those two, like I said, and then down below that diameter weight um, BC. If you wanted to manually enter that stuff in, you could do that in those fields there. You obviously see G7 toggle there. Um, we're gonna go through the bullet library. We're gonna pick a six millimeter. So right here you can see, so there's Burgers, Hornady, Sierra, uh, Vapor Trail listed in there. We're gonna pick a Hornady. We're gonna scroll down, find our bullet. Now, once we, once we find our bullet and we select it, you're presented with this, select the solver type. So G1 and G7, this is a traditional ballistic coefficient based solver. And so there are some limitations with that. Uh, typically what you find is the exact bullet you're shooting, um, the drag curve shape of that specific bullet is similar to, but not an exact match to what a G1 or a G7 is. So a G1 is essentially a flat based bullet with a fairly short stumpy ogive or nose. Um, so maybe like a traditional 
lead point, uh, spire point hunting bullet that would be applicable for a G1. A G7 is a, is a longer range uh, aerodynamic design that we're used to shooting in long range precision shooting. So a long slender ogive, a boat tail to reduce the base drag. That's what the G7 uh, projectile is. But your specific one, even though it might look like one of those standards, um, is, is unique to itself. And so that's what Ford off is. If you see that Ford off option down there at the bottom, what that means is we've taken that bullet that, that you're selecting um, and we've done a whole bunch of stuff to it. We've modeled all of the mass and inertia characteristics to, to play into the dynamic behavior of the bullet. It gets ran through a database where a bunch of the um, projectile dynamics from a, a, a moments and coefficients prediction standpoint, a bunch of those are gathered. And then the bullet gets ran over Doppler radar. And what we get with Doppler radar is the exact um, loss of velocity profile of that bullet. So when we talk about bullet drag, what we're really concerned with is how fast does the thing slow down? Um, if we know how fast it slows down, we know how long it was exposed to gravity. You can get a, um, a calculation on how far the bullet dropped over a given period of time. Um, now with the, with the Ford off files, with all of those being ran over Doppler radar, they're an exact match. They're, they're as close to perfect as you can get. Where the G1 or G7 options are kind of an assumption-based uh, prediction. So there's, there's going to be more errors that show up if you decide to use a G1 or a G7. Typically, those errors grow with range. So you won't see much error in the first, say, five, 600 yards. But as you extend that range out, what you're doing is extending time, the amount of time that an error can show up. The more time a bullet's in the air, uh, the, the bigger the errors are going to become between your prediction with a BC and the actual point of impact on target. So using G1 or G7, they're great out to a couple hundred yards. Just understand you might have some errors beyond that. And that's really the reason why we did Ford off in the first place. So if you have the Ford off option, I would highly recommend you use it. It's not available for every bullet. If you're shooting a traditional spire point hunting bullet or a varmint, like a VMAX bullet or something like that, you know, shooting 1200 yards with a VMAX really isn't the intention of that bullet. Um, so that bullet won't have a Ford off file available to it. But if it does, you'll, you'll see it here. Wait for it. So we pick Ford off and you'll see <clears throat> right in here for bullet file, it switched. If it was going to be a BC based calculation, it would say BC. And this would say either G1 or G7. When you select Ford off, it's an actual bullet file because with a BC, you're loading a number, right? A BC number, let's say it's 0.300 for a G7. That's one number that attempts to quantify a bunch of different characteristics about your bullet. With Ford off, when, when you see it load this thing, the, the Ford off file, in the background, what it's doing is loading a file with over 400 unique values that go into the calculation of that exact bullet. So it's substantially more adv advanced um, under the hood than, than a traditional BC calculation. Down here, muzzle velocity, pretty standard. Zero range, we're gonna talk about zero range and zero angle. If you tap that zero range, you saw me tap the text there. Um, what this allows you to do is toggle between zero uh, range and zero angle. We'll talk a little bit more in detail about that here down the road. Um, if you already know what your zero angle is, let's say you are a current user of the Hornady phone app and you've already gone through the zero finding zero angle process, you already know what that is for your rifle, but you're wanting to put that rifle into the Kestrel and you're just gonna you know, manually enter all your fields that are pertinent to that file you already have built on your, on your Hornady app. You can just collect or uh, select zero angle here and type in that angle instead of having to refind it again. So that's what that feature is for on the Kestrel app. If you haven't done that, you're not a Hornady phone app user and you wanna find your zero angle, you'll be doing that on the Kestrel device itself, which we'll walk through. Okay, and then some other standard inputs, bore height, you should measure from the center line of your board to the center line of your scope. There's some great setup videos from Kestrel again, as well as some from Hornady. Twist rate, same thing. Uh, scope units, mills, minutes, that kind of stuff. Oh, jumping ahead here a little bit. I'm not talking as fast as my finger is on this video. Okay, uh, axial form factor. That's another uh, input value that if you're using the Hornady phone app and you've already done all that work, you know what your axial form factor is. You can just manually input it here before you transfer that gun to your Kestrel. Uh, if you have not done that, 
you and you're only using the Kestrel, um, you'll find that on the Kestrel device itself. It'll go through a tutorial walkthrough, makes it super, super smooth and easy. So we'll talk about what that is when we get there. Down here at the bottom, the MV temp. So typically, uh, depending on the propellant that you're using or is loaded in your ammunition, um, propellant and the primer, both in combination, respond differently from a, a burn rate standpoint to the temperature that they are. So the, the ambient temperature of the ammunition. So if you're, uh, you're a hunter and uh, you left a box of ammo sitting on the dash of your truck and you have the defroster on, that ammo might be pretty hot when it's actually pretty cold out. Uh, vice versa, you know, you leave it sitting in the sitting outside in the wintertime and it's really cold. Whatever the temperature of the ammo is, your velocity can change because of that. And that's what this section down here accounts for. So a temp sensitivity factor, what this is, is a number that quantifies the amount of change in feet per second of, of velocity per degree Fahrenheit. So a temperature sensitivity factor of 1.0 means that your velocity is going to change one foot per second per degree. And the majority of the time, uh, hot temperature exposure. So when it's hot out, your velocity is going to increase and cold temperature, it's going to decrease. So if you put a 1.0 in there, um, what it will do is the, the Ford off will automatically update your velocity based on the temperature that the Kestrel is measuring. So for it to do that, you have to feed it a baseline temperature. So whatever the temperature was when you measured your velocity, if it was 68 degrees out, like it is in the case here, um, but we were out shooting and it was 30 degrees, uh, that's 38 degrees cooler. What it's going to do if it was a temperature sensitivity factor of 1.0 is it's going to drop your muzzle velocity 38 foot per second automatically because your ammo is cold and you're going to have a slower muzzle velocity. So that's, that's what this section is here. Um, you're going to see me click on this list icon here in a second. And what we've done is um, in our ballistics lab, We've tested a, a large swath of the commercially available powders that are there, mainly concentrating on the ones that are used in precision shooting. So that's typically a temperature stable powder from Hodgden Alliant, um, IMR, you know, a lot of the, the main powders used in the long range game are in there. And what we've done is we test those from negative 20 to plus 140 degrees Fahrenheit. And then we pre-calculate what the temperature sensitivity factor is of that powder for you. So you can see those, those values listed in there. Um, you also have the ability to input your own, which is honestly, if you want to be as accurate as possible, you should test this yourself. Um, one of the ways I like to do it is I wait till um, the winter time. If you're in some sort of a cold climate, that's best. If you're down in Florida, it's not going to be as easy. Um, but I wait till it's really cold out. I'll leave some ammo outside. I'll leave some ammo in an ambient temperature, say my house or, or in a building or something. And then I will turn my truck on, crank the heater as much as it'll go. And I'll leave the Kestrel sit in there and I'll leave some ammo in there and get it warm, right? Usually you can get it up to hundred degrees or so. Uh, and then I'll take that ammo and I'll test it through my gun at those three different temperatures. Um, obviously moving it as quickly as you can from the temperature exposure. So when I take it out of my truck and I'm doing this in the wintertime, I try to go as quickly as possible from my truck to the gun and shoot it to see what the, what the velocity was. And then you can calculate the amount of change that you saw with your specific load from cold to hot temperatures and come up with a custom temperature sensitivity factor. So the stuff we supply is kind of a general trend. Um, it can change lot to lot on powder. It can change with primer. Um, so if you really want to be as accurate as humanly possible, you should do that test yourself. Hey, Jaden. Yeah. Uh, we had a question. If you guys have the temp sensitive sensitivity factor for the new stable 6.5, powder? I don't think that one's added in there. Um, that'll be coming. There's a couple new ones we've tested. Stayball's really good. I mean, Stayball's near zero. Um, you could put in a 0 0.1 for Stayball and you'd be good. But essentially, think about a 0 0.1. For you to get a one foot per second change in velocity, that means you're going to have 10 degree change in temperature. So if it, if it changes 50 degrees out, you, you change your velocity five feet per second. That's still within the window of normal velocity variability. So I'm not saying it's nothing. You should account for every little thing you possibly can. Um, but Stayball's stay ball's pretty flat. So whoever asked that question, if you're using Stayball right now, you can leave it alone. You don't even have to enter anything. Um, Stayball's a really good powder. Okay, so we back out of there. Um, and that, that pretty much sums up when you create your gun on the, the uh, Kestrel app. 
you'll save it. You'll, you'll push that over to the Kestrel device. Um, yeah, so here we go. Now we're transitioning to the unit, turning it on here. And I think I go through the menus. Yeah, so we're talking about range here. Um, scrolling left and right with that target menu does your range. You can do the same thing in the target sub menu. You can change your direction of fire there. Um, so direction of fire, you can change the units from o'clock to degrees, depending on what you want to work in. Obviously, the Kestrel has a compass in it, and you can capture your direction of fire by pointing the back of the unit at the direction that you're shooting. It'll use the compass that's in the Kestrel and, and gather that direction of fire. You can see you can change it from o'clock to degrees there by toggling left and right. You can go down to capture down below that to capture it. Um, if you change your battery on your Kestrel, you're going to have to do your Cal Compass, which is a, a little bit of an art form, I'm, I'm sure, in the Kestrel community. But just do what it says, you know, and, and it'll calibrate. We've improved it. It's better. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Cool. So, so make sure you do your firmware updates. Um, but with the firmware update, you now just spin it around for 30 seconds. It doesn't tell you, it doesn't yell at you for being fast or too slow. It's uh, as long as you keep it level and spin it around. And I was like the master. I was the guy that people came to, to get their Kestrel calibrated. Now I'm not going to be a cool guy anymore. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's cool. That's great. Uh, here's inclination degrees. So if you're shooting uphill or downhill, that's where this value is input. Um, obviously you have a couple different ways you can gather that value. The most common is with the range finder that will, that will spit out um, the angle to your target. There's some old school methods, the old slope doper. I'm sure that thing's still around. You can estimate it too. Um, you know, if you, if you have absolutely nothing and it's a really steep angle, uh, definitely don't leave it at zero because you're likely going to miss um, depending on the range of your shot. This is I cosine. So the cosine equivalent value of the angle that you selected when you were in IDEG and IDEG. Um, Fordoff doesn't use a cosine. So cosine was, was there's a thing called the rifleman's rule um, where you take the cosine value of the angle you're shooting at and you can either multiply that against the range to your target or against your elevation solution for a flat fire. And essentially what it does is provide you a quick down and dirty um, correction for the changes that are going to occur in the trajectory of the bullet when you shoot uphill or downhill. Um, it works okay for relatively close ranges, probably inside 400 yards, um, time of flight dependent. So it depends on the bullet and cartridge and environment you're shooting in. Um, but I cosines in there more is just an informative um, output on, on this unit than it is an input that is actually used for calculations. I think that's what I'm talking about there. That it's just kind of a output. Target speed. So if you're shooting a mover, this is where you'd input your target speed, wind direction, wind speed one, wind speed two. We'll talk about those in more detail under the wind sub menu. But they are in the target menu if you want to adjust them while you're in there. So left and right scrolls your range when your target menu is highlighted. Down one is wind. If we go into the wind sub menu, you'll see you have wind direction, wind speed one, wind speed two. So wind direction, you can uh, manually adjust that yourself with the left and right. Same thing with the wind speeds. And you can also capture it. Uh, if you hit the center button, it'll give you the option to capture. You point your unit into the back of the oncoming wind, uh, hit start capture, let it read the wind for long enough to get a good idea of, you know, the min max av kind of thing. If you got gusts coming in um, and then it's going to give you your min and your max on your wind speed one and wind speed two. Open your impeller cover, you know, if the wind's blowing and you're reading zero, maybe check to make sure the thing's spinning. So there's the start capture screen, the end capture. Another thing I like to do um, is acid check this direction. So when you do when you do your wind capture, if you didn't um, update your direction of fire, if you didn't point the Kestrel unit, uh, the back of it facing the direction of fire and update that first, when you go to capture your wind, 
it's going to read off of whatever it thinks the direction of fire is because the Kestrel doesn't know which way you're shooting. It just has the compass in it for you to tell it the, or the direction I'm shooting and the direction the wind's coming from. So if you just go straight to capture your wind, just double check and make sure that that wind direction seems realistic. We'll back out of the wind menu, go down one into the gun menu. So here we have our muzzle. Well, up top is gun, so you can rename it. If you were to build this on the Kestrel itself, you didn't do it on your phone, you can go in there and uh, rename the gun. So you can see there's where you do the naming. That button, that red one up top, deletes characters. You scroll up and down to change the, the character itself. Down at MV. Left and right allows you to adjust your muzzle velocity. This is if you have temperature sensitivity factor turned off. If it's turned on, you can't edit your muzzle velocity there. You have to go down to that MV temp. You can see it's off right now. If we were to toggle that on, it locks your velocity because it's automatically adjusting your velocity for you based on what the Kestrel measures as a temperature. Um, so just know that. Like if you go, oh, I need to update my velocity. I just recoronated it, but I can't adjust it. Go into the sub menu and see if your temperature sensitivity is on. So this essentially gives you the same abilities that the app did. So you can come in here, you can, you can plug in the temperature sensitivity value here, give it your baseline temperature and the baseline velocity um, that you measured the velocity at that temperature at. Um, you can't access that list of powders from the Kestrel device itself. That's only in the app. So that's something to keep in mind. Jaden, yep. a question just came through from Craig that once he gets his axial form factor and he inputs the data, will it lower his muzzle velocity in the Kestrel to compensate? No, there's no, there's no muzzle velocity truing in the Hornady Kestrel. Um, when we're talking here, we're, we're strictly talking about the, the change in internal ballistics effects that temperature causes on your ammunition and the effects of the velocity that, that are a result of that. So uh, the traditional, I, I'm assuming he's refer referencing the traditional truing of a muzzle velocity. Uh, the, the Hornady Kestrel doesn't do that. You feed it the right velocity and whatever you, whatever you measure. And then when you do your axial form factor calibration, which we'll talk about here in a minute, that's all you have to do. You're, you're clean from there. You don't have to go playing with velocity. Now, if you had no velocity measurement at all, that would be the only time I would condone the use of truing muzzle velocity. If, uh, you don't have a chronograph, you got nothing. Your barrel is dramatically different than uh, our 24 inch standard test barrel that we use to pre-populate velocities for you if, you if you go into the ammo library and you have no clue what your velocity is. That would be the only circumstance that I would recommend that you change your velocity to get your drop numbers to match up. If it's a measured value, especially from say a lab radar or some, a, a magneto speed, something that's a high quality chronograph, uh, I wouldn't argue with it because it's a measured number. Craig, you can come off of mute too, if, if that's... Yeah, if I didn't answer your question, I want to get it addressed properly. So if, if that wasn't right, please let me know. Yeah, you answered my question. Because um, when I used the Kestrel, when I shot at the gap grind a couple weeks ago, we were calibrating the Kestrel. And then once we'd done the axial form factor, and we went back and looked at my data, my muzzle velocity was actually lower than what the magneto speed after we input it into the Kestrel. Okay, so you did axial form factor and then you went back and checked velocity after and you found out that your velocity yes, was Yes, my muzzle velocity was actually lower. Okay, so what I would do in that circumstance is you knew the range uh, that you shot your axial form factor at and your point of impact, right? So you could essentially go back and redo your axial form factor when you updated your muzzle velocity to a measured number and just and just complete it just go through that process again with that known data you had you know i did my axial form factor at 800 and i was hitting two tenths high but i didn't know what my velocity was so i left you know everything was matching there but then i shoot over a chronograph and oh no my velocity is actually 50 feet per second slower than what i had input when i did my axial form factor 
that's fine because I still know that I shot at 800 yards and I hit two tenths high. So what I'm going to do is update my velocity like I, as it's measured and then just go back into axial form factor and redo that process again and tell it you're hitting two tenths mil high again and it'll, it'll redo it based on that correct velocity that you have. Did that make sense? Yes, sir. That answered my question. Great. Thanks. No problem. All right. Keep rolling here unless there's any other questions, Katie. Good. Okay. So yeah, we're just talking about the adjustments that you can make on the, the Kestrel itself. We talked about most of that already in the app um, setup portion. Appreciate you guys uh, bearing with me on the, the narration of this video when uh, it's not necessarily synced up to the speed. All right, so we're backing out of there. Again, turn on or off MV there. We back out again to the main gun menu. So you can see I'm scrolling left and right and the muzzle velocity isn't adjusting. That's because I have my MV temp turned on. So if I wanted to adjust it, I need to turn that off. And then I can scroll it left and right. Uh, drag model right there. DM is what that stands for. So um, drag model is set to G7 or G1. Again, that's your BC based stuff. If it's a bullet file, it'll say BF. That means it's Ford off because there's an entire file of information being loaded about your bullet. Now, when you send a gun over to the Kestrel, um, you're allowed to have one bullet file and the two BC files are active as well. So that's something to check. You know, if you, if you built your stuff with a, a Ford off bullet file, um, if you weren't paying attention and you accidentally were highlighted here, like this shows on bullet file and you hit the toggle left, or right, it could toggle to BC. Um, so just pay attention to that. It does allow you to use BC on any active gun file that you have. Again, we'd recommend that you use a bullet file if it's available for that bullet. And you can see when, when we toggle it to BF there, that BC value gets dashes through it. That's a non-editable field because when you pick a Ford off bullet file, there is no more BC. Again, a BC is one value that tries to summarize the drag characteristics of a bullet among other things. And uh, the, the Ford off bullet file has a ton of numbers that define that. So if you did set it to BC, those fields then become editable for BC bullet weight and bullet diameter down below that, but we're going to leave it on bullet file. Continue on down here. ZA. So we have it set to zero angle right now. Um, if you go into that, sometimes it'll probably be set to ZR if you send it over with it with a zero range. Um, you go Once it's on ZR, you hit that center button to go into the, the sub menu there. That's where you can toggle back and forth between zero range and zero angle. Now, what, what are those two things? This is a really important distinction with Ford off. Um, I'm going to use some exaggerated terms for, for effect to hopefully uh, convey that message a little easier. Um, so we're all used to zero range, right? If, if our rifle is hitting dead on at 100, it's zeroed at 100. If it's hitting dead on at 200, it's zeroed at 200. There's limitations to that because the, the reason that, that that bullet is crossing the line of sight at 100 is a function of a whole bunch of different things. That bullet's drag characteristics, the velocity it's traveling at, the environment that it's traveling through, wind conditions, the angle of the shot uphill or downhill, all those things go in, come into play um, when we talk about the shape of a trajectory, the parabola, or where a bullet is at a, as a function of time and space. With, with zero range, you're, you're limited to the environment and the conditions. So if we were to dramatically change the conditions, uh, wind is a great one with aerodynamic jump, you're going to see a shift in your zero. Most um, hunters or match shooters, if you've ever traveled a long distance to a new location that's a totally different environment um, or, or even totally different wind condition, if you don't even change the location, you'll see that your zero can shift around. This is why we re-zero, right? You go to a match, you zero before you shoot the match. You go on a hunt, you zero before you head out for the hunt. 
the reason that occurs is because there's the the environment all those things i described are, are changing the the path that your bullet is is on so if we were going to give that exaggerated example that i that i noted um let's say we we take a rifle and we shoot we're going to have we're going to have it hitting dead on at a thousand yards so we adjust our scope we're hitting dead on at a thousand yards in in this environment and let's say that that environment is you know 30 40 degrees at sea level that's pretty pretty high air density um we take that exact same rifle and we don't change anything. We leave the load, the scope, everything is set exactly the same. The, the powder that's loaded in the ammo has no change with velocity. So velocity is identical if we change temperature. Nothing changes, right? Exact same circumstance. We take that rifle and we go up to eight or 9,000 feet in the summertime when it's 80 degrees out up in Colorado somewhere. Dramatic change in the air density mainly, right? Now we have a lot less air density because we're at high, uh, high altitude and uh, high temperature. If you shoot that rifle at a thousand yard target, are you going to hit that target right on center where you were at sea level? No, absolutely not. Because of those effects of the environment, there was a change of shape to the trajectory. You're actually going to hit high because of the, the reduction in air density. When, when you're using zero range, what you're telling a program is, I don't care about anything else you tell me. I don't care about the bullet you're shooting, how fast it's going, what the environment is that it's flying through, what the winds are, what the angle of your shot is. I don't care about none of it. If you tell me that the bullet is crossing the line of sight at 100, I'm going to make it cross the line of sight at 100. Because when you when you provide a ballistics program a zero range, you're giving it a reference. It knows where the bullet is as a function of range. You have to have that to make a sighting correction. Otherwise, all you have is a raw drop number out of the barrel because there would be no sight on it. So... What, what happens with zero range is there's some, some falsifications that can occur. The bullet doesn't hit exactly on at 100 yards because you say it does. The bullet doesn't care what you say. The bullet hit directly on at 100 yards because the angle the barrel was pointing at and the environment that it was flying through, that's what caused it to hit at 100 yards. <coughs> Excuse me. And if you think about, if we, if we take the, the sighting system off of a gun, we take the scope off of it, why does a bullet go where it goes? because it was launched with a barrel at a certain angle, right? We held the barrel at a certain angle and that bullet was going a certain speed through a certain environment. That's why it goes where it goes. The scope doesn't dictate any of it. When we put a scope on a gun, all we do is give ourselves a magnified, very finite ability to point that barrel at a certain position in space. So what zero angle does is exactly that. When, when you go through this zero angle process and you calculate trajectories based off of zero angle, what the program does is says, okay, this is the launch angle of the bullet. This is the drag characteristics of the bullet. You told me how fast it's going in the velocity. You've described to me the environment, or in this case, the Kestrel has measured it. I have the wind speeds. I have all that stuff. The bullet's going to go here because it's been launched at this angle through that environment. Where with zero range, it says, I don't care about any of that stuff. It's going to cross the line of sight here. And then I'll start paying attention to environmentals and wind and all this other kind of stuff. So what you can see with zero range, zero range works. It's worked for a long time, um, but there's limitations to it. And, and small errors really matter. So uh, one of the questions I pose is, is uh, does a quarter inch shift to your zero matter? Most of us don't see it. That's within our group size, right? If you have a three quarter minute rifle, you're pounding out a rag, ragged hole in a piece of paper. You can't even really see a quarter inch. Um, but if you, if you apply the math to that, a quarter inch shift at 100 yards is worth two and a half inches at 1,000. Now, that doesn't sound like very much, but let's, let's put some more definition to it. If we're shooting a, a one minute target, which is small at 1,000, especially for competitive rifle stuff, so uh, call it a 10 inch by 10 inch target. If we artificially change our point of impact by two and a half inches, Understand when we shoot long range, not all bullets go in the same hole. We're shooting a really accurate shotgun pattern at distance, right? You shoot a group at 100 yards, they don't all go in the same hole. You have a small patterning that's called dispersion. That, that dispersion grows as a function of range, and it really grows when you get past like four or 500. It's not linear anymore. So if you shoot one-inch groups at 100, 
you'll shoot two inches at 200, three inches at 300, but by 700, you're shooting like eight, nine inches. Um, it's nonlinear in its growth. Well, what happens is we take that shotgun pattern that we're shooting and we shift it artificially up two and a half inches, which, which would be the equivalent. If your zero shifts on you by a quarter of an inch, that's two and a half inches at a thousand. That's a dramatic reduction in the hit probability that you're going to have. You're going to have way more rounds falling off the target than falling on the target. So it's really important. Those things really matter. Well, when you run the zero angle, it fixes those things for you because it accounts for all of the things that could possibly shift your zero outside of a mechanical issue. If you throw your rifle off the top of a mountain or it, the scope gets banged, some mechanical relationship changes between the scope and the action and therefore the barrel that's, that's tied to it. That's the only circumstance that can occur where zero angle can't account for it. If it's anything environmentally going on or wind or angle, uh, angle of fire, any of that stuff that happens, zero angle will account for it. So what happens is you, we'll go through this process here. Um, what you do is you shoot, uh, just like you'd zero your gun, you shoot at a given range. Here's where we're going we're gonna to go in and toggle it to zero angle, and we're going to go down and cowl the zero angle. So note there. You can't throw like a protractor up on your barrel and figure out what your launch angle is, what your zero angle is. It's too finite. We're talking um, a fraction of a degree down to like the third, fourth, fifth significant figure. It's very finite. So the way we do this is we ask you to shoot a group just like you would when you zero your gun at a traditional zeroing distance, 100, 200 yards, somewhere in there. And tell us everything that was present when you did that. Tell us what the environment was, environmentals were. Tell us what the wind was. Tell us if there was any angle um, when you were shooting. Tell us everything about this shot and then tell us where you hit. Did you hit dead on? Did you hit a 10th of an inch high? Did you hit two tenths of an inch low? Where did you hit? We tell the program this information and what it says is, okay, with the bullet you're shooting, at the velocity you're shooting at, at the environment that you told me you're shooting through, with the wind conditions that are present, all that stuff. The only way that that bullet could possibly hit at that location, a 10th of an inch high, is if the launch angle of the barrel was X when you shot it, which is how it actually works. So you'll see as we go through this process, that's what we're feeding the program for that information. So you would go into the, the zero range submenu. We toggle it over to zero angle and you can see cal zero angle pops up down here. So this is to calibrate zero angle. We're going to go through that process. It's going to ask you for your latitude. Again, this will come from the, the Kestrel app. If you don't know yours already, it's going to ask you for environmentals. We need to know what environment the bullet's flying through. So we capture those. It's going to ask us the distance to our target. It needs to know that. So we'll set the distance to our target. And to the exact number, if you can get it. I mean, if your range finder says 104 yards, put in 104, not 100. So we'll say 103, give it the direction of fire, point your Kestrel at the direction of your, your zeroing target, hit capture, capture the wind. We already described that. Make sure your impeller's open. Wind's a big one to capture because aerodynamic jump can wreak havoc on a zero big time. Okay, so we gave it the wind. Now we're going to tell it where we hit. Now under this target menu here, if you go into that, you can change it from mils to minutes to inches. Recommend that you shoot no less than five shots. Uh, would prefer 10 or, or more. I personally shoot 20. Um, we find that the, the mean point of impact or, or the average point of impact uh, on five shot samples bounces around a bit by sample sizes of 10. If you shoot 10 shot groups, it's much more stable. And by sample sizes of 20, it's pretty much static. Um, so typically what I'll do is I'll shoot two 10 shot groups when I'm going through this process. If I want everything to be as, as, as perfect as possible in doing that, I haven't had to re-zero my match rifle in the last three years. I just show up to a match and shoot. There's no rechecking zero or any of that stuff. So I'm spending 20 rounds up front, but I never have to do it again. So it pays off in the long run. So we go in here, let's say, uh, let's say you're at a public range and you don't have the ability to go down to your target after you shoot it. All you can do is mill it or you're at a competition. You can't go down range on the zero range. Um, you can input in mills. So if I was two tenths of a mil high or I was a tenth mil low, whatever it was, I would input that in here. We would recommend that if you can go down to the target, uh, you go down and you actually measure each bullet hole from your point of aim. Uh, would recommend you use calipers to do that down to the thousands or uh, the ten thousandths of an inch. 
and uh, and you average all those up and divide by your number of shots, and that gives you your mean point of impact or your average point of impact. That's what we want to input in there. So here I have an example target. So what I would do is measure, if this was my point of aim, I'd measure from here up to each bullet hole, and I would note what that was. You know, this is probably 0.55 inches, 0.52 inches. If it's below, I give it a negative. So this would be negative 0.1, negative 0.05. This one up here is plus 0.49. This one's plus 0.7, plus 0.8, plus plus one because that's a one inch grid those are half inch grids so one inch full and 1.1 up here 1.2 whatever it is average all those out by the number of shots i fired and then i get my mean point of impact and that's what i'm going to input in here now this seems like a lot of work on the front end where you can just lay down and zero your rifle and yeah it's zeroed at 100 yards but i can't emphasize enough on how much value there is in taking the time to do this part right and saving you problems down the road it it It'll, it'll save you time and money if you do this now versus fighting yourself when you actually go out to a thousand yards and you see that you're off by two and a half inches, you know, all your stuff's hitting high. Um, you could save all of that by just doing it here. And again, once you do this process, uh, so there you can see a zero angle output number. So if we told it we're hitting dead on it 100, that's fine. You, you, you can let's say you're hitting inch and a half high and you want to adjust your scope. So it's closer to a traditional hundred yard zero. That's fine. It doesn't matter. Or you can leave it alone. You can leave it an inch and a half high. The program doesn't care. It just wants to know where you hit. Um, but you can see that angle here. So 0 0.0932 degrees. So you can see like, that's really finite. You couldn't throw a protractor on the barrel and, and discover what that angle is. You have to shoot it to find out. So you can see if I tell it I'm hitting 0 0.32 inches high, that angle changed. Once I got it done, I hit accept and you're good. Again, once you've done this process, you can go anywhere in the world. You can, you can shoot in any set of conditions and you don't have to worry about it. Just update the Kestrel to what the conditions are and it's gonna tell you where the bullet's gonna hit. So it'll account for any, any changes that are present. The only thing that's the exception is if you have a mechanical shift, like you take your scope on and off, you drop your rifle really hard and it, it uh, loses its zero setting within the mechanics of the optic itself. So we go down below that, uh, zero angles, bore height, again, height above bore for your scope, rate of twist, elevation units, you can change from inch, mil, minute, pretty standard stuff. Down here at the bottom, axial form factor. So Craig, uh, this is the process I think you described going through at the gap grind. So this is where um, earlier on in the video, I, I talked about how advanced those Fordoff bullet files are, the, the radar file that goes with them, all of the, the projectile dynamic information that's, that's spit in there. Um, what we found is uh, if you have different twist rates, if you have different muzzle brakes, a bare muzzle, a flash, or a flash hider, suppressors, different propellants, all this kind of stuff, all those different variables can change the drag of your bullet very, very slightly. So in tens of thousands of rounds that we've studied on the radar, what we do when we put a bullet in Ford off is we shoot it out of as many different conditions as we can, different barrel makers, different twist rates, different muzzle devices, different powders. And we see small differences in the drag. The drag curve shape is the same, but the magnitude of them from an up and down standpoint um, changes very slightly. So the axial form factor gives you, you the ability to tweak that last little bit of error out that, that may be because of your gun or your muzzle brake or your suppressor or something like that. And so this process is very similar to that zero angle. We're going to feed it all that same information, um, but we're going to do this at a further distance downrange. We, mo we need more time of flight to expose an error in drag. So you'll see when we go in here, it gives you a recommendation of selecting a target between um, three or 800 yards. Those are general guidelines. Um, more specifically would be from a time of flight basis, which would be a time of flight window of 0.5 uh, to 1.3 seconds. Um, so the reason we, we go with that window is inside of a time of flight of 0.5 or out to about three or 400 yards, there hasn't been enough time for any differences in the drag of your bullet to show up from a point of impact standpoint. Beyond that, they start to show up. So you'll start to hit low or high, depending on the specific drag of your bullet out of that barrel. Now, when you go beyond 1.3 second time of flight or beyond eight, 900, maybe even a thousand yards, depending on the cartridge, 
what happens is your group size, that dispersion that I talked about a little bit earlier, it becomes large enough that your ability to make an accurate determination that, yes, my bullet's drag is wrong. It's different than what the program has in it. Based on shooting a target that's so far out there that you're shooting a, a two-foot group, it becomes really hard to do that with a small sample size. I mean, you can do it, but you need to be shooting 20, 30, 40 shots to get an accurate determination on, is it actually high or low? Well, there's cost associated with that. You don't want to go burn up your barrel and shoot a bunch of rounds just to figure out, you know, the last little tweak you need for your drag. So this program, being that it has all that other stuff right about the bullet, the, the radar drag data, all the dynamics are already in there, that solves a lot of the old BC problems that, that made us have to true things way, way out there, at really long ranges. Um, so you'll see the recommended window here coming up. Again, you can manually set this if you want. If you're, if you're coming off the Hornady app, you already have your gun file built, you've already done this process and you just want to plug it in, you can manually do it. But we'll go through the the process here. Go down one more to Cal Axial Form Factor. And it's going to look very similar to that zero angle that we just did. Now we also don't limit you. If you want to do a Cal Axial Form Factor at 1400 yards, you can. Just understand the further out you go, the more shots you need to shoot to make a statistically valid claim that the that the drag of your bullet out of your system is different than the average drag from the radar. And you may find that at three or 400 yards, there's not enough that shows up. Uh, a 10% drag window is worth like a half an inch. Well, you're not going to see a half inch difference at 400 yards. Uh, you'd have to shoot again a lot. So you might have to, you might have to play with this range recommendation and, and work your way out to a distance where you start to see that drag show up. So again, we tell it the range to our target, kind of like we did with that zero angle, but obviously you have a different range that you're going with here. So we're going to scroll this up. I think I go to 700 or something. 770. So that's the distance to the target we're shooting. We'll hit continue. And it's going to want all that same info. Give me the direction of fire. Give me what the wind speeds are. Again, acid check the wind. Make sure it seems right. Now in here, you see a similar screen to that um, find zero angle. So we have an elevation input, a calculated axial form factor, just like the calculated zero angle. Um, so what we're going to do here is we're going to tell it the elevation that we needed to hit our target. So if we shoot and we're two tenths of a mil low, uh, this is where this is where we would feed that info in. Or if you go down and you actually measure um, in inches on a shooting a, a paper target, you can do that as well. So we had six six mils dialed on our scope when we shot at 770, but we actually hit at 6.1. We were a tenth of a mil low. Our axial form factor would be 1.02. We hit continue, accept it, and now it's calculated. Now that's done. Once you've done this process, that rifle and that bullet and that load is set up. You don't have to tweak anything. You don't have to go true if you change the environment. You don't have to change your muzzle velocity trying to true that. You don't have to re-zero. You can take this system and go anywhere in the world and, and shoot in any conditions and it it's ready to go, which is, which is really cool. So again, it saves you a ton of value because you don't have to re-zero. You don't have to re-true when the environmentals change. All that kind of stuff that, that a, a lot of the BC-based codes um, have an issue with sometimes. You can obviously delete your gun there, uh, kind of just some general stuff. You can see your elevation, your wind solution. Environmentals. Uh, this is another good one, especially when you're at a match or something. You can see it's on lock right now. So when Enviro is highlighted, you toggle left or right, and it'll go from live to lock. I like to turn mine to live where it's actually measuring stuff, get a good measurement, and then lock it. If you leave your Kestrel sitting in the sun or something, especially at a match in the summertime, um, it, can, it can get heated up and it'll, if it's on live, it'll read a a really hot temperature when it's not quite that hot outside.
you can go in here when it's on when it's on uh, lock. You can go down here and manually edit any of this info if you wanted to. Now, a common question we get <clears throat> related to environmentals and right there, density altitude. So we get this a lot, this question a lot with Ford off. So uh, guys ask, well, why can't I input a density altitude? The, the reason for that <clears throat> is that density altitude comes out of the aircraft world, um, the subsonic aircraft world. What density altitude does is, is it gives a pilot one number to make an assessment on his takeoff weight if he's going to be able to take off at that density altitude or not. Essentially, it's a combination of temperature and pressure that gives an air density calculation that's referenced to an altitude system so it's easy to understand. So essentially, I may be at 5,000 feet of altitude, but because it's 20 degrees out, it's really cold. It's the equivalent of being at a standard altitude at 2,490 feet. So it gives pilots an ability to, to make quick judgment calls there. Now it's creeped its way into ballistics because it simplifies the problem of temperature and pressure where those two things can work in different roles. Higher temperature, lower air density, higher elevation, lower air density, and vice versa. So if you have opposing values there, they may equate to the same air density, even though it's totally different temperature and pressures. Now the problem that density altitude can get you into is air density is only one portion of a bullet uh, drag uh, characteristic, I guess you might say. The other part of it is Mach number. Bullet drag is actually tied to Mach number. And one of the main drivers of Mach number, without getting into Reynolds number and some of those really scientific aspects of it, is temperature. As your temperature changes, the speed of sound or Mach number changes. So what can happen with density altitude is I can, I can give it um, a, a temperature and a pressure that make the air density calculation correct. But if my temperature is wrong, that means my speed of sound calculation that the program is going to use for drag calculations is wrong. So we're falsifying it. So we don't allow the use of density altitude as an input to Ford off. The other reason is a lot of programs will take the input for temperature, pressure, and humidity, and they'll use those to calculate an air density. And that's what they use for the, the ballistics calculation themselves. They assume that it's a flat fire solution, which generally refers to any shots um, inside of a 15 degree window. Now that, that kind of comes out of the artillery world. Um, but what Fordoff does is you have to feed it a temperature, a pressure, a humidity, and an altitude. Now the Kestrel's feeding in an altitude in the background um, based on the, the barometric pressure it's reading. So you don't really have to worry about that part. But it needs all four of those because what happens in the Ford off is when I tell it, okay, I'm at 2,000 feet above sea level. This is the temperature, this is the pressure, and this is the humidity. What it does is it builds an environmental table inside of the engine, of the, of the Ford off engine. So it says, okay, well, at 2,000 feet, it's 60 degrees. Then at 5,000 feet, it's 32 degrees. It, the, the rate of change of temperature and pressure is, is fairly constant within the atmosphere. And so it builds that table based on what you tell it where you are. Then what happens is when, when it runs a solution, it knows the bullet's position from an altitude standpoint on earth. And it takes into account any temperature, pressure, and humidity changes that do occur due to a change in altitude. So the reason it needs all of those is to build that table. And that's why you can't feed it a density altitude. When you see density altitude down here on the Kestrel, that's just an output for your reference, but it's not an input used for the calculation. And one of the reasons that it's so important to have that atmospheric based table is when you shoot really long range shots at really steep angles, your bullet is let's say a, a uphill shot, a really steep uphill shot at 1,500, 2,000 yards, that bullet is gaining altitude fast enough that it's going through different temperature regimes. And when it goes through those different temperature regimes, those Mach number values are changing. And Mach number is the core of the aerodynamics. For it to have the correct calculations, it has to have the right Mach number. And so that's why this is in here. Uh, latitude, yeah, you can you can update that manually. So if you didn't push that over from your Kestrel, um, there's a whole bunch of apps and stuff where you just Google, you know, latitude of whatever place you're going. That's a general number. It doesn't have to be super, super accurate. 
down in the ballistics menu, you kind of just have some different values. You can do range. You can see your elevation, your wind solutions there. It's kind of just a, a catch-all. Um, you'll be able to get your target lead if you had it set to a mover, the remaining velocity, remaining energy, stuff like that that might be important for a hunter or, uh, or if you're curious about what your velocity is at a given range. Manage guns. This is where you can turn them on or off. So if you have three guns loaded uh, and you're out hunting with one rifle and you don't want to accidentally use the wrong profile that you have in your Kestrel, you can turn those other ones off. I haven't moved enough. The light's turned off in here. Sorry. You got your light button over there if you're working in low light conditions, power button. And I think that's it. Yep. So let me, this is just a random other video playing on YouTube. Sorry. So uh, do we have any questions? Or is there anything you want me to go over, Katie, um, that I didn't on that video? Sorry, I have uh, puppy issues. <laughs> <That's fine>. um, <laughs> there we go. Uh, nobody else has posted any other questions. So, oh, here comes. Um, does the Kestrel Ford off model only allow three gun profiles? So I can actually answer that. And yes, at the moment, we only have three gun profiles that can be stored on the Kestrel. <laughs> but on the app, it is limitless. You can store as many different profiles on the <laughs> Very sorry. 11-week-old <laughs> puppy. That's all good. I might uh, might show everybody this image real quick. Um, <clears throat> we were talking about that. Uh, I think I, I was talking about a quarter inch shift on your zero at 100 yards and what the effects of that is at 1,000. So what we have here is, is two targets. This is a, a hit probability based thing. But um, again, here's that patterning I was talking about, the dispersion. So this replicates a thousand yard target that would be a one minute square. So hey, Jaden, your screen that's sharing right now is still the YouTube. Oh, um, okay. Hold on. Um, yeah, I, you have to stop sharing and then start sharing again. Okay, let me see if I can. And another question that came through was if their axial form factor won't correct, what would you suggest for correcting? There's something else wrong. Um, if, yeah, so actually that's a point that I did miss. Um, so we limit you on the axial form factor to a plus or minus 10% window. And the reason we do that is again, in, in tens of thousands of shots on the radar, we've never measured the drag of a bullet that's outside plus or minus 10%. So what happens is like with a traditional BC based method, when you true, you're not limited in how far you can true things. Or if you're going to true a muzzle velocity, you're not limited on, on how far you can drop or raise the muzzle velocity to get your stuff to line up. And a lot of times what happens is the problem is elsewhere. The problem isn't velocity or the problem isn't drag or not to the extent of the problem you think it is. Let's say you're hitting a mill high. Well, drag may be three tenths of that but you still have seven tenths of an error that are unaccounted for with those other methods. There's no limit to keep you from adjusting your BC until a full mill shows up, which is crazy. Like that's, you'd have to shoot a totally different bullet to have that much difference in drag. So we limit you with that plus or minus 10% window. So if you reach the limits of that and, and you still can't get to where you need to go, you know, you adjust your axial form, you're hitting a mill high and you adjust your axial form factor all the way to the limit and it only accounts for half of a mil. So you, you're still hitting half a mil higher than it'll allow you to go. That means there's something else wrong somewhere. You either have the velocity wrong or your zero is wrong, whether you're using zero range or zero angle. Those are the only things that can cause that to happen. The, the bullet drag is not at fault. And so the fact that we limit you there really helps you from chasing your tail because what will happen with, with the other methods is a, is, a, is a limitless adjustment. Let's say with a BC, a guy can take his BC and adjust it you know, he's shooting a, a six, 540 grain bullet. That's essentially a 300 class G7, right? Regardless of manufacturer, that's really close. So I'm shooting a 300 class G7, six, five, and, and I'm hitting a mil high at a thousand, just throw a number out. Um, for me to adjust that BC enough to make up for one mil at a thousand, I'm going to have to take that BC from a 300 G7, probably to like a 400 or a 450. I, I didn't do the calculation. I'm just spitballing here. 
that's totally out of the realm of possibility. There is no way possible that you can build a 6540 class bullet with a 400 or 450 G7 BC. Not possible unless the thing is propelled like a, a rocket. Won't happen. Can't. So, But there's no limitation for you there. So, so a user that isn't really nuanced in how those ballistics calculators work and, and what the limita realistic limitations are, he's going to adjust it to that value because it makes his stuff line up in that environment. The problem becomes as soon as his environment changes, mainly temperature again. Remember, I said everything is tied back to Mach number. Once your temperature changes and that Mach number range shifts on, on where uh, your bullet is operating from a Mach number standpoint, everything goes out the window. And so you see this a lot. And if you, if you talk to guys at matches, they'll say, I had my stuff all chewed up when I was here, but I showed up here and now I'm missing again. My stuff's off. That's because his Mach number envelope changed on him and he doesn't realize that's what it is. So back to that axial form factor, the fact that it limits to you to a plus or minus 10% keeps you out of trouble because we won't allow you to adjust it out of the realm of possibility. If you hit the limit of the possibility and you still need more, go back and check your inputs because you have something wrong. Um, again, the likely culprits are muzzle velocity. It's dramatically out of whack or your zero has, has changed. And that may take you, maybe you dropped your rifle or something, or maybe when you did zero angle, you didn't do it properly, or maybe you have the wrong zero range input. It takes something along those lines to cause that much of a drag error to show up. Hopefully that answers his question. Yeah, did that help you? Um, Jason, you can come off mute too. So anybody, when I repeat your question, you're more than welcome to come off of mute and follow up or help direct. Uh, that, this is Jason. That was, that was those are my first two thoughts: is that it was muzzle velocity and zero angle. And the other thing, I, I was wondering if it would affect it if I set my zero angle. I set it about um, I think it's about two thousand feet, um, and it was a pretty warm day. And then I went up the mountain and shot at five thousand feet, and there was snow. Would that affect the axial form factor if I set it in those conditions? Very like different than my zero angle. No. No, okay. because because what that axial form factor is doing is it's it's accounting for any unique circumstances that exist with your barrel or your load. It's like a mechanical thing. It's not tied to the environment. So uh, we've we've done a huge study where you know, like a, again, I said we we've shot different barrels and twist rates and brakes and rifling forms and all this different stuff, and we find that there are small differences there. So when you load that file um, for the first time and you have not done an axial form factor calibration, what you're operating off of is the average drag file. So we note all those differences, right? We shot it out of uh, all these different conditions and then we average all those files together and that's what you're presented with when the axial form factor is set at 1.0. That's the average file of a whole bunch of barrels, twist rates, brakes, suppressors, all that stuff. But your specific gun, the way it's set up, it may have... Uh, so another statement would be, we've never measured a muzzle brake, a flash suppressor, or a sound suppressor that has ever lowered the drag. It always increases the drag. So it's likely that if you're not using a bare muzzle, essentially like a bench rest crown or a target crown, if you're using some sort of muzzle device, a brake, a suppressor, or a flash suppressor, you're likely going to have to increase your axial form factor to a 1.0, 1, 2, 3, 4, whatever that may be, because you're probably going to hit a little low. And the reason for that is uh, the, the, the bullet is, is most likely, as it comes out of the muzzle, the, the way the gases start to, the, the base pressure around that bullet, anytime you put a muzzle brake or something like that on, you're, you're robbing the symmetry of that um, base pressure off the bullet, and you can cause it to kick a little bit. And so you've probably heard the term a bullet goes to sleep. It's kind of a general term. Um, bullets always have a little bit of wobble to them, like you'd see in a in a football when a quarterback throws it, right? A little bit of wobble to it. Kind of the same thing with a bullet, magnified a whole bunch of times from the standpoint of speed and spin, but uh, it, it's very similar. Um, so bullets are always doing this a little bit. Well, the more a bullet's doing this, the higher the drag's going to be. So if your muzzle brake causes the bullet to do this more than the average one that we put in the program, you're going to have to tweak your axial form factor to account for that. And that's what you're doing. So it's not necessarily that you're accounting for environment or anything like that. You're accounting for the, the specific state of that projectile coming out of your system. Hopefully that answers your question, Jason. Yeah, thanks. That helps. Thanks. Good. Any others, Katie? Um, well, it looks like Leon has his hand up. 
Okay. Do you want to asking you to unmute? Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> this is like my second Zoom call, so I'm, I'm a little bit, uh, you know. Anyway, um, going back to the question, and sorry if I'm getting you to repeat yourself, because I just want to make this clear, make sure I got this right, because I'm actually new to LRP and the Kestrel as well, and I've been a little bit confused about um, zeroing it in. You're, you're saying that if you do the zero angle, then you shouldn't have to worry about re-zeroing your scope no correct. matter where you're going? That's correct. Oh, man. So what will happen <laughs> when you do your zero? So I told you I haven't re-zeroed my match rifle in three years. And right. I've, shot, I've shot matches from 8,000 feet in Wyoming in the summertime uh -huh. to sea level in the wintertime totally different environments right and different wind conditions and all this stuff and i and i don't re-zero my match rifle here's what happens uh, when i go to wyoming to shoot the the night force elr match in the middle of summer at 8500 feet right the, you know the air density is very low up there in the summertime whatever those conditions are mm. the program is going to predict because it's starting from zero Again, mm. remember, when you run zero angle, what you're doing is the program is saying, okay, this is the angle that, that when you did your zero angle, it found that angle, right? That's the launch angle of your barrel. So what it says is, okay, this is the launch angle of my barrel. This is the environment I'm flying through. These are the wind conditions, all that stuff I said before. The bullet's yeah. going to go here because of that. So what happens is when I show up at that Wyoming match and I, and, and I set it to say they have the zero range set up for 100 yards for the for the uh, day before the match zero checks right yeah if i walked up there to the zero range update my kestrel for the environmentals right. update it for the wind speed direction of fire all the stuff i'm supposed to do and i right. set it to 100 yards it might tell me to come down two tenths of a mil right if i shoot uh, you know i just lay down and i shoot i'm going to be two tenths of a mil high yeah so it told me what i needed to do to hit that 100 <clears throat> yard target it told me i needed to come down two tenths of a mil because of all those conditions that were present the reason for the reason for that, like my, I've been yeah, zeroing, -zeroing my sucks, rifle. man, and it costs you a whole bunch of money. Like, yeah. it, it, how many times have you re-zeroed in a year? Is it five? <laughs> if it more let, than that, let's let's just make yeah. easy numbers here. Let's say it's ten, right? Right. You've re-zeroed ten times in a year, and how many rounds do you shoot when you re-zero? Probably at least 10, right? Because you're going to yeah, shoot a couple point, and you're right. going to see it's off and you're going to make an adjustment and you're going to shoot and the adjustment wasn't exactly what you wanted. So you're going to make another exactly. adjustment and then you're going to shoot enough rounds to make you feel comfortable that you got your zero where you want it. Exactly. So let's say 10 rounds, right? So yeah. 10 rounds, 10 times a year, that's 100 rounds. What's the right. cost of 100 rounds? Man. Um, well, I reload, so it's... <laughs> it's less, but it's still there, right? Your your yeah. time involvement and also lack of confidence. Right. What happens when yeah. you show what, what happens when you show up at the match and you had a flat tire and you get there half an hour before the zero range cl range closes, but you still got to go register and the wind's blowing 15 miles an hour on the zero range and you shoot and you're like, "Man, I don't know where my stuff's at." And you're walking yeah. into to the stage 1 of the match or on a hunt, right? And you're not confident. There, there is definitely something to be said about being confident in your system and the correlation that has to your level of performance. And seeing Doug on my screen, I'm sure he could attest to that way more than I can. Uh, Let me ahead. ask you this right quick. Um, so when you do this, and I apologize because I'm, I'm new to this, right? You're fine. The, the angle F factor, do I still need to do the angle F factor if I do the zero angle? Yes, those are two different things. So when, okay. you do, when you do the zero angle, what you're figuring out is what the launch angle of your barrel is. You're finding out right. the angular relationship between your line of sight optic and where mm. the barrel is pointing. Because once those two are tied together, then you're uh, good. Okay. What the axial form factor is, is that is, does your specific system, your barrel, your muzzle brake, have some sort of influence on the drag of the bullet that makes it a little bit different than the average drag that's in the program? So the axial form factor is done at longer ranges. Uh -huh. because we need the time of flight to be long enough to expose okay. a difference in drag between the program and what your specific bullet has coming out of your specific system. Is the axle F, is that true in? 
you could you could view it as truing because it's similar to it. However, truing is a different process. Truing is the process of trying to take two drag curves that are not the same shape. So in the right. program, there's a drag curve. And what that essentially is, is the roadmap of bullet drag that the program is going to use to predict how fast your bullet slows down. Call it, right let's call it a gas mileage chart, fuel mileage yeah. chart. It says that on, on, on a flat <coughs> ground, the fuel mileage is this, and uphill, the fuel mileage is this, and downhill, the fuel mileage is this. You could think of it like that. That's what that chart represents. But it's about your bullet, right? So, so what happens with truing is when you true, you're using a BC-based program. When you right. use a BC-based program, you're using a BC-based drag fuel mileage chart. So it's the fuel okay. mileage chart of that specific artillery projectile that the drag model is based on now your bullet right. is very similar to it so it's like it's like we have a drag mo uh, uh, a fuel mileage chart of an f-150 right it's known mm -hmm. all the fuel yeah. mileage of that f-150 is known but we're driving a ford ranger it's a very similar shape to that f-150 but it's not going to get the same fuel mileage right it's going to be right. similar but it's different that's what bc is so when you use bc what you're trying to do is take the fuel mileage chart that's that's set for that F-150 because that's the only thing the program knows yeah. and you're, you're feeding it a, a corrective number for your Ford Ranger. That's what a BC is, is a correct. It takes that known F-150 chart and it moves it around to correct it, to try to make up for what the F-150 does. So what okay. you're doing there is there's mismatches between the F-150 and the Ford Ranger. When you true, you're attempting to bend things to match you're trying to bend the ford ranger curve to match the f-150 actually it's the reverse you're trying to bend the f-150 curve to match the ford ranger curve and so it's, it's if, fairly effective but it's limited so if i'm using the ford off z and zero zero angle and the axle f i don't need to true the rifle at 600 800 yards only if you see a difference in your point of impact and your point of aim and you only have to do it once so okay. if, you if you shoot at 800 yards and the thing's dead on, you don't have to touch yeah. a thing. But if you yeah. shoot at 800 yards and find out that you're two-tenths of a mil low, yeah. it, it may be because of your muzzle brake. It may be because some, some, some something thing is there, causing so that. There's a variable, yeah. yeah. And that, and, okay. Yep. And so that's I'm what really that glad is that you, I'm really glad you said that because, like I said, I've been turning up to all these places, different training and stuff like that, and I've always had to re-zero my rifle everywhere that I've gone. You know, and everybody's talking about truing. And yep. Jesus Christ, if I, if I had known you could just do that once, oh my <laughs> God. <laughs> well, so I asked you, I asked, you know, we just ran that example. How many rounds do you use in re zeroing for a year? Oh, well, man. How many, like well, you said, well, 10, 20. 10, how 20. many rounds do you use in truing a year? Because it's more than re zeroing. Because I, yeah. guarantee, I guarantee you, if you're having to true and you're doing it at distances, generally that are well past a thousand because that's what it requires because mm. you're trying to bend the back end of that curve uh it seems like to it shoot didn't a matter bunch anyway. of shots yeah. yeah it seemed like it didn't matter anyway because like you said everything would change the way it, it'd pick up on a little bit of wind and i'd have to stop listen i appreciate it i better stop talking now. <laughs> stop oh, you're, you're fine that was a great question <laughs> all right thank you you're welcome All right, does anybody else have any other questions? Hey, uh, Jaden, this is Jason again. I, I'm not sure if this fits the scope of your, of your discussion, but uh, last week I took my Kester out hunting and I use a, a Ranger, a Bushnell Connex Ranger. Mm -hmm. um, and and I was, you know, by the time I'd get, you know, sitting over a ridge watching a field and, you know, targets out to four to 600 yards. And by the time I'd see something um, and kind of like this, I mean, granted, it was the first time I took it out. So I'm not real, not well practiced with it, but, you know, to range it, laze it, um, windage drop, get my Kestrel to talk with everything. <laughs> um, I don't know if like any of the other guys have experience with that or maybe like as you're running stages you know, do you, like, I thought about maybe like leaving my Kestrel, like rather than the 15 minute shut off, leave it on for an hour. Um, but if, you know, if you went longer than that, you're still trying to turn it on, wait for it to everything to sync up. Just curious how guys are getting quicker firing solutions um, with that. So again, if it's not quite the scope of your conversation, that's cool, but I, I just thought I'd ask. Yeah, great question. Um, I, I'll talk to my experience, but it may be the case that other people have better experience than I do. Um, so I typically try to run a good quality battery in my Kestrel. So like the lithium energizer, I think that it comes with, um, I try to, I try to run that 
specific battery um, because of the battery life. And I, I set my auto shutdown to off. If I'm hunting or I'm at a match, um, I want that thing on all the time. I don't want to have to deal with trying to get it turned on in the heat of a moment, you know, oh, I'm the next shooter or, oh, there's, you know, the game animal I'm pursuing. Uh, so I leave it on and I try to run that battery. Um, I've ran, I run the uh, Vectronics uh, Terrapin X, which will pair up via Bluetooth with the Kestrel. And uh, I haven't had much issue with like Bluetooth connectivity loss or timeout or stuff like that. Um, they will time out with each other. They go into a low energy mode, mode and you typically have to tap your rangefinder to wake it up. And then the Kestrel, the Kestrel is always awake. Um, yeah. It just then, you know, kind of re regains the connection. Um, that's kind of my experience, if that answers your question a little bit. Yeah, that was sort of my solution. I just, I, I didn't want it to like die. <laughs> and yeah. so, you know, yeah. like to be without a battery, but yeah, um, maybe how long the batteries last is like days, weeks kind of thing. Or is it like, could it run out in a day if you left it on all day? I just, I just got it. So I'm still. But those high quality it. ones, I would say, I mean, it's condition dependent on batteries, right? Cold and heat right. have different effects on batteries. Um, yeah. Mine last well over a day when left on all the time. And I use uh, um, the data log feature a lot, which uh, most users probably don't play with in, in the Kestrel. Katie probably got sick of me asking her questions about data log years ago. Um, I use data log all the time for all kinds of stuff. Um, and I, you know, there's certain settings on data log. If you want it to read every two seconds, you know, take a recording every two seconds, it has to, the Kestrel has to stay on. And I do that kind of stuff constantly. Um, probably drives my wife nuts too, but it, the batteries will last quite a while. So yeah, but, the, specs, you know the specs on the batteries are actually uh, two to 300 hours. Um, okay. But if you're connected to that Connex, um, that Bluetooth connectivity is going to drive down batteries. Like Jaden said, the cold weather certainly drives down batteries. Um, unfortunately, the fuel gauge is not, I mean, speaking from Kestrel, I don't think our fuel gauges are very good. So when you see a percentage of battery, it's not always indicative of how much battery you have left. The Kestrel that I just used for a match, I had 5% for the past three weeks and it still lasted me the whole weekend. So um, I would definitely just carry one other spare lithium AA because it's yeah. not going to lose your gun. It's not going to lose anything if the battery dies, if you switch out the battery. The only thing you lose is having to recalibrate that compass, but it's a good thing to just have in your pocket. Yeah, thanks. That's that's a great idea. Um, can I ask one one more question? Sure. Is that okay? I just, uh, uh, one question I had to you was, is there any, I know I've heard people say like, you know, like most people use 5% of their Kestrel and I know it's a complicated question, but like, do you have one thing that most people really don't know about that you maybe could kind of introduce us to here or have you covered it already? Like, is this like in the 90% of our Kestrel in terms of its ability? So one other thing that I do, um, the Ford off Kestrel allows you three profiles. Um, and what, what I do is I build myself three files of the exact same gun and i name two of those files fast and slow uh, one of the biggest contributors to missing a target in long range shooting is the normal variation in your muzzle velocity so if you shoot your muzzle velocity and you do a five shot string you're likely going to have an extreme spread in muzzle velocity anywhere from 10 to 30 feet per second depending on the quality of ammunition that round that's the fastest is going to hit the highest the majority of the time. And the round that hits the, the lowest is going to be the slowest the majority of the time. So what I do is I build myself, I, I build three files that are exactly the same. I name the one file fast and I go in my, into my velocity and whatever I believe my velocity variability is, which I'm a huge fan of large sample sizes. Um, it hurts the ego to shoot a 30 shot group for velocity, but it gives you a better sense of reality. Um, that single digit SD that everybody's always after probably isn't going to be there after 30 shots. It may be, but it may not be. Um, so I, I set the velocity, whatever I, let's say I shoot, let's just go with 10 shots just to make an easy realistic number. Uh, I shoot 10 shots and I find my fast velocity is 2830 and my low velocity is 2800 just for easy numbers. On my, the, the file I named fast, I'm going to change the velocity on that to 2830. And the file I named slow, I'm going to change it to 2800. And then my, my middle file, I leave at 2815, which let's say that was the average. 
Then when I'm out shooting, if I hit high on a target or low on a target, I'll go to my gun um, on your Kestrel. You go to your gun where you can toggle between guns and I'll toggle it. Let's say I hit low. I'm going to toggle it over to my low file and see at this range under these conditions, if I missed by three tenths of a mil low, could that three tenths of a mil be accounted for by normal velocity variation? If it can be, then I'm not going to worry about it because that's just the noise in the system. That's normal. By by doing that, what you'll what you'll help yourself do is stay out of trouble. Because I see this at every match I go to, and I, I I've seen it from military circles all the way down to beginners, right? The most advanced level guys currently serving all the way down to to somebody that's just beginning. When they experience a ballistics problem, they immediately go try to change something in the calculator to fix it. But understand you're shooting a pattern. It's a grouping. Just because you see one point solution on the screen of the Kestrel, 7.2 mils, not every bullet is going to hit at 7.2 mils. The average, the majority will hit around that 7.2 mils, but you're going to have some that hit at 7 mils and some that hit at 6.8, and that's totally normal. But running those three files keeps you out of trouble. So let's say I shot and I was half a mil low and I checked my slow file and it said, no, you should only be two tenths low. Maybe there is something wrong. Maybe when I dropped my rifle on that last stage, my zero shifted. Right. It kind of gives you it gives you a sense of what is reality, what is possible and, and kind of lets you operate within that envelope um, to take it even to a more advanced level. That would be the basic version of that. A more advanced level would be the same thing. Create the three files, adjust the velocity the same way I described. But then the other thing I do is when I do my zero angle and I measured all those bullet holes on my low file that I named low and put my slowest velocity in. When I do my zero angle, I'll go in and do redo the zero angle on that file and I'll set it for whatever the lowest bullet was in my group. Whatever whatever height that lowest one shot was, I set my zero angle to that. And then on my fast file, I do the same thing, but I set it for the highest one. Because that grouping that you fired at 100, that's just a cone that's going to get bigger as you go down range. So that round that's high at 100 is going to be the round that's high at 1000 as well. So now you've added one more layer, one more factor that goes into dispersion you've accounted for. And then take it one step further, whatever my axial form factor, when I did my axial form factor calculation, let's say it came out at 1.0, just, just for the sake of an easy number. When I have my, my low file, I'll take my axial form factor and raise it up 2%. It'll be 1.02, so higher drag by 2% causing me to hit low. Higher drag would cause you to hit low. Lower drag would cause you to hit high. Go to my fast file, do the exact same thing, but take my axial form factor down to 0.98. So I would drop the drag by 2%. Two plus or minus 2% is kind of a lot. A really good bullet's going to be plus or minus 1% or less. Um, but all those things stacked up gives me the extreme limits of what I can expect for a high or a low shot. The slowest velocity with the highest drag and the lowest the lowest round in my group is going to be the lowest shot I could possibly have in reality that, that is attributable not to some error or problem somewhere, but is real. So that would be an example of not using your Kestrel to its potential, uh, but that's a pretty detailed process. Thanks for that, Jaden. And sure. just to be clear, like you're just trying to just to get a, a good bracket of if it's you're not, not that you would use the slow rifle or the fast rifle, but that you're just trying to say, is it within the parameters of my slow and fast? That's basically, you're just trying to isolate it to that. Right. I'm not going to use that for my solution. You know, I'm going to use yeah. my average file. Cause that's what we're, when you pick, when you're using the average, you're, you're attempting to mitigate the normal, the normal variability that occurs above or below it or left or right of it. You know, um, that's, that's the purpose of using an average, uh, but I use those lows and those high files to acid check myself and see, am I within the normal noise of the system in what just happened, what I just observed, or is something else wrong? The fact that you can run two wind values in the Kestrel um, technically has two different aerodynamic jump values, but you'll see there's one elevation solution that's displayed. So aerodynamic jump, for, for those that don't know what that is, um, is a, a vertical component. So it's an elevation um, effect that is caused by crosswinds. It'll cause you to hit high or low depending on the crosswind and your twist rate of your barrel. Right hand twist barrel winds from the right will cause the bullet to jump high. Winds from the left will cause it to jump uh, low. Um, 
and the Kestrel will account for all that stuff. And you'll see it if you play with your winds, your wind speed and your wind direction, you'll see your elevation solution changing. And that's what that is. That's aerodynamic jump that's doing that. If it's not a head or a tailwind component, which can also do that at, a, at more extended ranges. Um, but the elevation solution in the Kestrel is based off of the wind speed one setting. So the aerodynamic jump value from wind speed one is what is being applied to the elevation solution on your Kestrel.